this is a joint work with uh, quite a few people. Uh, Jonas Helsen, Jonas Kitzinger, Emilio uh, Albert Werner, Jens Eisert and Ingo Roth. And uh, just from the beginning, I will just say I, I will keep the talk relatively untechnical and uh, ideally just try to convey the main concepts uh, which went into, the, into this work. And in the ideal case, after the talk, you should be uh, able to, you should have a rough idea of, you know, what you would actually do in, in, a, in a lab. And as the title suggests, um, the main object that we uh, studied in this, this paper is some protocol, or maybe you can also think of it as like a family of protocols, for estimating many properties of channels from a few measurements. Uh, if you know this kind of a shadow, uh, classical shadows paper, it kind of, you know, you, you get the resemblance. But at this point, it might not be clear what these many properties of channels uh, could be. This will become clear later on in the talk. Um, but of course, like most things in, in, in research, this didn't like, you know, fall from the sky or appear to us in our dreams, but it is really heavily based on previous existing uh, protocols, which I will go through uh, here, namely randomized benchmarking and uh, classical shadows, uh, as Richard also already uh, explained a little bit in his talk. So I will begin with randomized benchmarking. Um, this is a little bit of, I mean, it's relatively recent, but also a bit older uh, protocol compared to like something like classical shadows. Um, but um, it has, it, 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 the rough idea for in randomized benchmarking is that you have some kind of quantum device and you want to, um, you know, get a rough idea of how much noise there is present uh, in your device. And there's a whole kind of zoo of randomized benchmarking protocols, and I will not go through this at all. Uh, we'll just consider the simplest one here, because this suffices to get the, the ideas uh, across. So what is, the, what is the goal? What is the problem at hand? Uh, basically, imagine that you have some kind of quantum uh, device that is capable of uh, implementing uh, unitaries from the Clifford group. And you want to know, on average, how much noise you you have when you when you implement such a such a unitary. Um, and the protocol is relatively simple. Basically, you apply a sequence of uh, some length uh, k of uniformly drawn uh, Clifford unitaries uh, onto some prepared state, say the O0 state. Then you apply the inverse of this uh, Clifford, which you can efficiently you know, compute what that would be. Um, and you know, I mean, at this point, you basically have just implemented a fancy identity because you've just ideally just undone what, you've did, did, what you did in your uh, sequence. But of course, there's some noise, which here, like this is the ideal sequence, how it would look like ideally, but there's some noise after each of these Cliffords. So yeah, when you undo it at the end, you don't actually go back to the, uh, to the uh, um, initial state. And in any case, you, you measure this and you, um, you try to estimate the overlap with the initial state. So the intuition would be that the higher the noise, the, the, the lower this overlap would be. And you repeat this for uh, many different uh, sequences to get an average of this kind of overlap. Um, then the next step is to basically just repeat this uh, for different sequence lengths. And again, the intuition behind this is that the the lar the you know the larger you make this the sequence length, um, the lower this uh, overlap will be because basically the noise will uh, amplify. In fact, you can uh, show uh, theoretically that this, um, um, this will actually drop exponentially 
in the sequence length. And what you would then do is basically take your, take your experimentally measured you know, your, your data from the experiment and fit the, to, the, to this uh, exponential decay from which you then basically extract these decay parameters, which, well, okay, you can, if you want to, associate to something called the average gate fidelity, but you can also just think of them as a benchmark uh, in themselves. So if you have uh, low noise, you have a slow decay. If you have high noise, you have a fast decay. And then you can go ahead and, you know, compare your device to your friend's device and say you have a better one. I don't know. Uh, and... Yeah, that's the idea of randomized benchmarking. Now uh, we'll switch gears a little bit and go to classical shadows or shadow estimation. I always can use both, but classical shadows is the right thing to use. Um, here, I mean, Richard, Richard has already talked about this before, but I will just repeat because it usually doesn't hurt to repeat things. Um, here, the... Um, you know, the, the setting is a bit different. I mean, basically the motivation for classical shadows is that uh, full tomography is expensive, but sometimes you don't really need that. You just want to estimate observables. Um, and in this case, you don't necessarily need to have a description of the whole state. And again, there's like many variants of, of classical shadows. And again, we will just stick to the simplest one. Um, the conceptually simplest one, because it suffices to bring the point across. Um, and okay, so just to specify the problem again a bit more concretely. So, what's the what's the goal here? So you're given some unknown state row, and you want to estimate trace or row um, for some large set of observables, which might not even be specified to you uh, a priori, because as uh, Richard said. If you actually know what you want to estimate, then there usually are better ways to do this uh, than this. But this works quite well in this kind of agnostic setting where you don't know what a priori what you would want to know. <laughs> I mean, if that makes sense as a setting, but it sometimes could make sense. Um, okay, and now how do you? What do you do? You basically it's again very simple. You apply some. Um, randomly drawn unitary from some ensemble. I, mean, I, I left it relatively, re relatively general here, but basically just think of the Cliffords again um, and, and measure. This is basically just uh, measuring in randomized basis, right? And now the uh, output is just a bit string and you store these tuples of uh, the randomly drawn unitary together with the bit string. Um, which essentially you can also think of like as a stabilizer state. But these are called classical snapshots, and this is what you store. And then you do some classical post-processing uh, with these snapshots from which you can estimate uh, these sets of uh, expectation values of these observables, right? And the complexity of this task basically depends on kind of two things. On the one hand, this is called thing called the shadow norm, um, which will depend on the, obser the observable that you want to, the observables that you want to estimate. And on the other hand, your ability to, um, to compute this trace in a product uh, between your observables and some stabilizer state. Okay, so I've introduced sort of these two things. I mean, to some extent, there are some similarities because uh, both, you know, in, in both cases you, you do uh, randomized measurements, um, but there are also some quite big differences between them. On the one, I mean, we can see clearly that, you know, classical shadows, you, you get a lot for, for what you're doing. I mean, you, you can estimate exponentially many observables in principle, uh, while in randomized benchmarking, you just get a single number. Um, also, classical shadows are actually truly random, because you re I mean, if you, I mean, the, as, as I described, you just pick random uh, unitaries and measure, while in, the, in randomized benchmarking, at least the version that I described here, you need to do the inversion uh, at the end of your 
of your uh, sequence. So it's not fully random, right? And so this kind of begs the question, you know, can we take some ideas from uh, classical shadows and incorporate them into uh, randomized benchmarking to somehow like set the two on, on the same footing? And basically that's what we, what we studied in, in our paper. Okay, so this basically now brings me to our protocol, the one that we suggest um, in, the, in the paper. And uh, with all the background given, you will kind of immediately see the similarities uh, to these two uh, known and studied uh, protocols. Um, and yeah, so the way that I will present it, it will resemble mostly randomized benchmarking because I will assume that you have, you know, you, 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 you apply uh, gates and then there's some unknown um, noise channel. But in principle, you could also rephrase this as in, in the setting where um, you have perfect implementation of, of your gates and you um, kind of also act with a channel of interest in between them. But let's just stick to the, to the setting which resembles mostly randomized benchmarking. So again, it's a bit, I, I don't really specify what I mean here by you know, number, the properties of, of the unknown channel. This will become clear later on. But uh, let's just jump directly into the protocol. Um, so you basically do what you do in randomized benchmarking and just apply sequence of uh, randomly drawn unitaries from some ensemble. Again, just think of the Cliffords maybe. And now instead of doing this inversion thing that we talked about before, you just measure in the computational basis and do what you did you know, or what you would do in, in uh, classical shadows. You just store these classical snapshots. Uh, these tuples of the, the random um, Clifford, which now is like a, a sequence of Cliffords, and the measurement outcome. So basically, this is all you do in, on your quantum device. This is uh, all, all you would do on your experiment, and everything else is now done in, in classical post-processing. Um, right. Now, from your from your data that you've collected, your classical, uh, classical snapshots, you uh, and, and a set of what we call probe super operators, the, uh, these A's here, um, you can compute these things that we call sequence correlation functions. I would just give an intuition of what this, this, this is. This is kind of like the probability of getting the outcome uh, xi when you didn't perform the noisy experiment, but a perfect implementation of the, of the sequence. Um, exactly, so you, you compute these sets for all the AIs that you, that you have, and then you do what you would do also in, in classical shadows, you compute the median of means for each of these. And then, you repeat this for different values of k again for the different sequence, length, sequence lengths. And uh, in the paper, we again show that um, theoretically this follows uh, an exponential decay from which now you can extract uh, from the fitting parameters, you can extract um, these quantities here, these trace inner products between these super, uh, probe super operators and your unknown channel lambda. And these are also what, what uh, I was uh, talking about when I mentioned, I said these many properties of the channel. So uh, these are the properties of the channel. So at this point, this might be a bit abstract. So um, let's just go to a concrete example directly. Uh, I call it this inverse free RB plus. I mean, no, no, I, I just, yeah. Uh, so, now think that uh, your probe superoperators are just unitary channels. Um, and basically, as we described, for each of them, you will get a decay parameter from which you can extract these overlaps here. So wh why is that interesting? 
Firstly, if you only restrict it to having a single A, namely the identity, that value is what you would actually get from standard RB without, so from standard RB, right? But you've avoided having to apply the inversion gate. So that's already something. So basically, um, as a you know subset of what you can get, we retrieve standard RB without the need of uh, applying the inversion gate. But you can do way more. So one example would be you could uh, use this um, this protocol or this this um, protocol suggested by Kimmel et al. in 2014, and use uh, all of these data for to get a tomographic estimate of lambda, which is furthermore spam robust. Um, okay, so kind of this describes the protocol that we suggest. Uh, I hope it's clear. Um, now to some more technical results without getting technical at all. I mean, of course, like just suggesting this wouldn't be that, that much because it really resembles uh, these previous protocols quite a lot. I mean, the, most of the work uh, went into getting general sample complexity upper bounds in terms of something similar to the shadow norm, but quite more involved. And in fact, bounding this for particular ensembles, namely uh, global and local Cliffords. Um, so basically, we doing this, we find a large class of super of uh, super operators A for which this is actually sample efficient. And now to something a bit more, you know, numerical. I mean, here we don't have uh, guarantees, uh, but we we show that this works in practice quite well. This is something we call unitary noise optimization, and it works in the global Clifford uh, ensemble uh, setting. So basically here you <clears throat> just assume that lambda is unitary, and the idea is that you pick uh, an ansatz um, for this unitary in terms of your A, like you just, you know, you pick the A's to be an ansatz to the unitary, and you have to just optimize the parameters uh, in this ansatz in order to maximize this overlap. And um, by doing so, you get a good uh, representation for, for, this, uh, for this lambda. And I just copied a picture from the, from the paper. So on the left-hand side, this is how like a typical, um, yeah, how, how, how this data and the fitting would look like. Um, and on the right hand side, um, we see kind of a heat map where we had some, the, um, we used the noise which was parameterized by two angles. And we actually can see that the, um, uh, we, we get the right angles quite, quite efficiently. Okay, I didn't quite keep track with, uh, with the time, but I think as far as I'm concerned, this brings me to the end of my talk. Um, so yeah, what, what have we done? So um, we, have a, we have presented a protocol for estimating many properties, as I have described before, uh, for some unknown channel, for example, uh, the no a noise channel in your experiment, uh, which has many different applications. For example, this spam robust tomography, uh, this unitary noise optimization, which, which we talked about. There's also something called crosstalk tomography that we discuss in the paper, and this uses a local Clifford group. And there's also a paper by Jonas Helsen and Michael Walter and someone else I forgot, uh, which is much gate randomized benchmarking, which again kind of is based on this idea. Um, so there are already quite a few pro concrete protocols which come out of this kind of uh, more abstract protocol, um, which you know leaves open uh, you know different avenues to go now. For example, one could uh, consider different ensembles rather than uh, local or global Cliffords, 
um, <clears throat> or different choices of these probe superoperators, uh, which ideally would reveal uh, quantities of interest. And yeah, with this, I am done. have extensive time for questions. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, can you please comment maybe on the comparison of your work with the latest work of uh, Robert Wang on learning processes using similar ideas of uh, ra you know, randomized uh, toolkit and uh, shadow, but mm. for, for process. I have this paper on my reading list, but I haven't read it yet. Okay. So <laughs> unfortunately, I, would be, I wouldn't be able to give an informed answer right now. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks. Hi, thank you. Uh, this is a little bit of a technical question. Uh, so you you said that this uh, this method can recover results from um, randomized benchmarking, and I was wondering. So in in randomized benchmarking, one of the things that like goes into the proofs is that when you apply this gro global inverse gate, like you end up with a uh, twirl of your quantum channel. And I was wondering if you still recover something similar when you don't apply this inverse. Like how how does the the um, how do you manage to get the same result? Well, I mean, it's a bit uh, difficult now to, to kind of show to you how this works, but yes, you, you, do, have, uh, you do have this again, yeah. But you, don't, you just don't need to actually apply it in, like, physically. Uh, okay. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I'm an experimentalist and I actually have a poster on randomized benchmarking. So what I'm curious about is these error channels. Could Using your new method, could we extract more information about what's going wrong in my experiment so I can diagnose it better compared to randomized benchmarking? Because with randomized benchmarking, the fidelity you get is just, it doesn't tell you anything about the type of noise or the noise sources. Yeah, so <clears throat> I mean, the, the simple answer is like, as you said, right? I mean, or as I said before, like here, like in randomized benchmarking, you basically just get this one data point, like for this particular, for this probe super operator being the identity. And uh, this method now allows you to, from the same data that you measure experimentally, like without any further experimental overhead, you can. Um, estimate uh, the, uh, these other overlaps with um, arbitrary A's, I mean, depending on the efficiency. But so whether you can learn more about your noise, yes. For example, as I said, there's one, um, uh, one kind of concrete protocol that we suggest, which allows you to evaluate crosstalk. Um, and also, this other thing that I mentioned, uh, where we actually have these, these numerical experiments, where you can, if your noise has somehow this, uh, fulfills this kind of assumption of, of being unitary, you can um, maybe, I mean, we don't have a proof that this always converges, but numerically we see it working well, you can actually get uh, a good representation for your noise. So, yeah, you can, retrieve, you can get way more information about the noise than just doing randomized benchmarking. Okay, thank you. I have a quick technical question. Where does the channel lambda mm -hmm. that you're learning about come into the protocol? Well, <clears throat> it's just there. Like you're just doing. <laughs> I mean, well, is it? Like when, what channel is this? It's like when you're do, when the idea is that this is the noise channel. Like you, ideally, it wouldn't be there, but annoyingly, it is there. So whenever you are applying the Cliffords, 
like as you're applying the sequence of Cliffords, you assume that every time it, this comes associated with with this noise channel uh, as well. And like the um, maybe I have a wait 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 here. So there, there's okay. Like you can assume like gate independent noise, for example, so that this lambda is always the same independent of of what uh, Clifford you've applied. You can relax this uh, uh, this assumption to um, to account for gate dependent noise uh, and so on. If the noise is gate dependent, what can you learn then? Then you kind of learn um, this. Okay, to be fair, the, in our paper, we only consider gate independent noise, um, but we are relatively, well, we are relatively confident that you can relax this to slightly gate, in, gate dependent uh, noise. And then it would be somehow like the, the quantities that you get are not anymore these uh, trace inner products with, with lambda, but yeah, somehow like an averaged. Uh, lambda. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Sorry, it's it's um, related to the last question. Uh, are there any assumptions on time dependent, time independent noise? I mean, here we are basically just saying uh, every you are applying the sequence, and every time you apply it, it's the same uh, noise that you that you get. But you know, we know from RB that uh, work on RB. <clears throat> that these these assumptions can usually be relaxed. So we haven't done this, but we are confident that it, that this can be done. Thanks. All right. If there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker one more time.